Welcome to the Max Future Weekly Podcast. All Apple talk and no chit chat. Okay, welcome to episode 100 of the Apple Podcast. This is Lex, and we've reached a milestone, and I want to thank everybody who's been listening. And uh, I never thought I'd get to 100 episodes of the Apple Podcast. And I've been doing this just for fun, just because I like to talk about Apple stuff. And um, we'll see how much longer I can go. And so remember, this is a chit-chat-free podcast about all things Apple. And you can help it out by giving it a positive review here or there. So thanks for listening, and let's get to some interesting stories interesting devices, interesting gadgets. So here we go, episode 100. Okay, so the first story is on cultofmac.com, and it came out, I guess, earlier today, and it really just shows you how transformative the iPhone is. You know, people forget what, what cell phones and smartphones were like prior to, I guess, what was it, 2007 when the iPhone came out. They couldn't do much because they were crippled by the carriers. And one story caught me at my eye today that really just shows how powerful the iPhone is. And a story in Cult of Mac reads, the headline reads, Syrian authorities ban the iPhone as Steve Jobs' dad protests brutality and killing. And, you know, as you may know, there's a revolt going on in the authoritarian dictatorship-like regime in Syria where the people are revolting. Syria, if a lot of people don't know, it is an Arab country that borders Israel and it borders Lebanon and Turkey and Iran. And for decades, it's been controlled by the Assad family. First Assad Sr., then he died, and now Assad Jr. And the family is actually part of a small sect, minority sect, that's only a teeny percentage of the population called, um, what are they? Um, Well, I'm I'm spacing out right now, but they're part of a small minority that's not part of the uh, the Sunnis. Um, And they've somehow controlled power and repressed the people. So... um, there's a major revolt, but here's the wild thing. So today, word comes that the Syrian regime is not allowing people to use the iPhone in the country. It says here, Syrians are no longer allowed to use Apple's iPhone after authorities banned the popular device this week in a bid to stop activists from documenting government violence. Following the move, Steve Jobs' biological father, John, Jandali announced his support for the Syrian people on YouTube. So remember, Steve Jobs is uh, half Syrian, and his dad was from Syria. And um, so I guess he, you know, he's very old, his dad. He never really, you know, made up with his son. But this is fascinating um, that the iPhone is such a threat to a government that they're banning it you know I mean imagine if this country ever did that but it just shows you how profoundly transformative these tools are and how Steve Jobs really did transform the world because maybe devices like the iPhone are empowering people to revolt against dictators this is what the Cult of Mac article says Uh, one Syrian activist believes that those found using an iPhone in a country from now on will be treated as a spy. And then it goes on to say, quote, it is enough for any tourist or getting or guest visiting Syria to own an iPhone to be a spy suspect. And the article says the move follows protests calling for political reforms and a reinstatement of civil rights in the in the region. Um, So Steve Jobs' father said, quote, I'm in solidarity with the Syrian people. I reject the brutality and killing that the Syrian authorities are committing against the unarmed Syrian people. And because silence is participation in this crime, I declare my participation in the Syrian sit-in on YouTube. So good for him. Good for a Syrian um, 
uh, Steve Jobs' Syrian dad. Um, but again, it's truly, truly transformative. And, um, you know, it would be nice, well, well, somewhere Steve Jobs appreciates, you know, that people appreciate his devices. So the iPhone's actually also changing customs and norms. And that's also ref reflected by an article in today's New York Times by Nick Wingfield entitled, Oh, for the good old days of rude cell phone gabbers. And it's really an article about the, the Siri function in the iPhone 4S. And it makes an interesting point. Um, the article says, is talking to a phone the same as talking in it? And basically the article is saying, are people annoyed with people talking to their phone as if it's a person, like the Siri function? It says, but the etiquette of talking to a phone, more precisely to a virtual assistant like Apple Siri in a new iPhone 4S, has not yet evolved, and eavesdroppers are becoming annoyed. In part, that is because conversations with machines have a robotic, robotic unsettling quality. Then there is a matter of punctuation. If you want it, you have to say it. How is he doing? Question mark. How are you doing? Question mark. Jeremy Litow of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, found himself telling his new iPhone recently as he walked down the street. This is what the article is saying. So I think, you know, they make a point. Look, every every technology trend changes and causes people to get annoyed. I remember when the iPod came out and people were walking around listening to music and sort of tuning out the world, you know, friends of mine who did not brace the iPod initially were very, very annoyed. Um, so this is just the norm. Every technology change sort of freaks out the people who are slower to adopt it. Now, the Siri function is brand new if you're not familiar with it. If you have an iPhone 4S, you can dictate questions and Siri will speak back to you and try to answer your questions either by answering verbally or by giving you a web page of some sort. So, you know, it's a good point that the New York Times is making that, you know, how will this technology sort of pan out in terms of people understanding it? Um, the article says, Another irritant in listening to people talk to their phones is the awareness that most everything you can do with voice commands can also be done silently. Uh, the article says, Billy Brooks, 43, was standing in line at the service department of a car dealership in Los Angeles recently when a woman broke the silence of the room by dictating a text message into her iPhone. Uh, and then uh, it goes on to say that he said, y you're unnecessarily annoying others at the point, but but not just typing by not just typing out your message uh, and that the bi women's behavior was quote just ridiculous and kind of sad well I kind of agree with that I mean I'm gonna be careful where I dictate into Siri I'm more likely to do it in my office with the door shut than I am you know out and amongst a lot of people or if I do it with other people I might do it like hey let let them know and say hey is it okay I'm gonna di ask Siri something you know so it does make a, you know, a good point, and I wonder if we're going to see a lot more people, you know, complaining. Now, in the comment section, one per person says, I feel sorry for people who aren't where they are. There's a time and place for these sort of things, and for the most part, it's not in public. We are too fast rocketing ourselves into a distort distorted reality that expects we must multitask at all times. Well, I just think we do sort of multitask at all times. It just happens. Um, another person says, yes, it's annoying. Yes, it's impolite. We all have stories. And yes, we all realize that barring a magnetic pulse it will continue and get worse, especially in cities w w uh, where we are in such close quarters. And that's the way it is. Genie out of the bottle stuff. Weird no one here or very few have ever been the guilty party. I confess I have talked on my phone set up an appointment via Siri and dictated a text message. Yes, I tend to stand off to the corner or walk down the side street, but I have. I will now join a three-step cell phone program. This is pretty funny and good for this person who wrote this because the point is we're all going to be sucked into this. Technology changes. The way people, the, the way people behave 
as people in public evolves, the, the norm evolves. You know, a um, hundred years ago, women would would wear long dresses that covered everything up that were dark, uh, and fashions changed. You know, people freaked out about that. Um, so I'm not too concerned about that. We'll find our common norm. Uh, we'll find our common place. But Siri's here to stay, and um, you know, people would be writing about these changes in in norms and how people behave. But that's the way it is. Now, some of you may know that Apple's preparing to, um, you know, reveal or open one of the biggest stores ever uh, in the Grand Central Terminal in New York City. And it's going to be a gigantic store up on the second level, I guess, overlooking the gigantic hallway. But a controversy has erupted because some people are claiming that the entity that controls the Grand Central Station, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, has given Apple a sweetheart deal for the space. And in particular, uh, officials from New York State's controller's office are, are investigating, like, you know, why Apple got a sweetheart deal. And basically, officials are, and then I'm reading the New York Observer here website, they say that state officials are curious as to why Apple managed to land a deal for only $60 per square foot when other tenants in Grand Central Terminal are paying $2, $200 a square foot. Um, and also, Apple won't be sharing sales revenue with the agency, unlike other tenants. Now, the MTA, though, in responding to these accusations, which were also in the New York Post, um, came back and said, you know, they're, they're, they're happy to defend the deal because they say, quote, this is the best possible deal for the MTA, quadrupling the rent we receive and bringing foot, foot traffic to Grand Central Terminal that will increase revenue from all our retailers. So here's the thing. The rent is actually four times greater than the rent that the, the tenant that was there, which was a restaurant, was paying. And Apple actually paid millions of dollars to that uh, restaurant to get them out of the lease and move out and they also made changes so the MTA says when you factor in that Apple paid to buy their way into that place that Apple is paying something like hundred eighty dollars per square foot um, because of the renovations they're making and they got the uh, other tenant out of the lease I think look the, the New York State controller is just trying to get some attention they know it's going to get a lot of publicity if they investigate anything involving apple so apple's not in trouble and frankly the mta it sounds like a rational move let's say that there was a restaurant in there with a very low rent locked in to a long-term lease so apple's paying four times greater than that rent sure it might be lower than the, the rent of a brand new lease but the mta couldn't get that tenant out the tenant was locked into a long-term lease at a lower rate. So Apple quadrupled that low rate, which might be lower than market rate. On the other hand, Apple also paid millions of dollars to buy out the tenant because the tenant obviously had a good deal with the below market rate. So look, I think these are just politicians trying to make hay. And, um, you know, it's kind of not that, not that serious. I bet you nothing comes of it. Well, the iPhone has been selling briskly, particularly the iPhone 4S, and I think it's going to continue to sell like crazy, in particular because the iPhone 4S is going to now be selling soon in other big markets. Electronista.com has a story out on December 2nd saying that the iPhone 4S goes on sale in Brazil and Russia uh, starting December 16th. And so they're are adding to the countries that have it. Um, it also says that an, that uh, another country is going to get it on that date is South Africa. Um, so this is huge. These are huge markets. And as Apple enters these markets with the iPhone 4S, I think its sales are going to really grow. Uh, now Apple. Um, you know, let's see, they do have, I think, some sort of list of, um, 
you know, of countries. I'm not sure if they have a list. But look, you know, I did see this graph. Somebody made a graph a while back that showed that Apple's revenue growth is really tied to how many carriers Apple's iPhones are on in the world. And I saw somewhere recently that Apple was only on something like 25 or 30 or 35 percent of all the carriers in the world. So Apple still has a great deal of room to penetrate the worldwide cell phone market. There are still vast areas of other parts of the world that have carriers that Apple has like no business on. So I'm really curious to see how Apple does this quarter because I think one expanding into countries like China and Russia and Brazil is going to fuel the growth, but also the fact that Apple now also offers a very cheap iPhone 3S for, you know, a dollar with a new plan. That's also going to help a lot. So, you know, I think these are, it's a time of expansion for Apple. Now, a real great area for growth for Apple is clearly China. And one of the key areas that Apple can grow in is through the big carrier China Unicom. And there's an article in Giga, GigaOM entitled, in the Apple blog, entitled China Unicom, One Small Step from Selling iPhone 4S. And the article, which came out on November 30th this week, says the iPhone 4S has made waves around the world, but it has yet even to enter uh, the water in China, Apple's second most important market. And uh, it goes on to say, we should see how it does it here there soon enough, however, as launch is just around the corner, according to China Unicom executive. The executive named Yu Ying Tao told Chinese news site Sina Tech that sales of the iPhone 4S will begin, according to the Apple blog, as soon as the company gets a certificate from the Ministry of In Industry and Information Technology, permitting it to do so. Now, I wonder if the Chinese are at all worried about the iPhone 4S, given that the Syrian regime, which is authoritarian, doesn't want the iPhone 4S there because it's subversive, because, you know, I mean, the more Chinese people have the iPhone 4S with its fantastic camera and internet connection, the more they can, you know, post abuse by Chinese officials or misconduct. So, you know, it'll be kudos to China if they allow the iPhone 4S to be sold there. It says here that the iPhone 4S has already passed governing w Chinese wireless regulatory standards, which means the hardware is legal to sell once it gets its final permission to use cellular networks. The article correctly points out that demand for Apple products in China is high. It says it is demonstrated by 10-minute sellout of iPhones in Hong Kong. So it's going to do really, really well in China. I was in China two summers ago in Shanghai and you know there were there were people peddling iPhones left and right there were stores with sort of bootlegged or gray market iPhones and iPads clearly you know there's a large part of that well a significant part of that population that really loves Apple products that sees Apple products as a luxury and they want the best you know, there are people in China who want the best and they're willing to pay extra for it. Okay, so now I thought I'd talk about something that I got uh, really interested in this week and sort of obsessed with. And, and really, in some ways, it is, it's excited me as much as the iPhone excited me when I first got the iPhone. And um, it basically is this device and also an app on the iPhone and iPad. Okay, so let's Let's first go to iTunes. And so the app is called OB Talk, or it's, it's called OB On. And there's an iPad version and an iPhone version. And this part is kind of wild to talk about because what the app is, it's, a, it's an app that works with the device. And it basically, if it works well, it's going to allow you to do voice over IP calls on an iPhone or iPad through Google Voice and receiving calls on Google Voice. Now, why am I excited about that? Because I truly believe 
that the cell carriers are kind of ripping us off. And here's why I think they're ripping us off, because all our communications through cell phones are really just digital data. I mean, even the phone calls are digital data. Yet we're paying, consumers are paying way too much money. We're paying like, like one person is paying about 80 bucks for, you know, uh, a cheap phone plan and uh, a data plan on the iPhone. Let's say you had an unlimited data plan and calling, not crazy amounts. And God forbid you should pay extra for text, then you're looking at like $100 a month. But why are, we, why are people paying 80 to to $100 a month for the phone? It doesn't make any sense, and here's why. Take a look at the iPad. The iPad is not a phone and has just a data plan, you know, if, if you want to do a cell phone data. And it's only $25 a month. Pay as you wish through uh, Verizon or AT&T. And for that, you get like two gigabytes worth of data a month. But if you think about it through voice over IP, like using, you know, in the past I've talked about apps like the Skype app on the iPad or or uh, the Two Call, um, I think it's Call to app. You can make calls and receive them on the iPad. But it's still a little bit clumsy. But the point is if the iPad can have a 3G data plan of like $25 a month and send it and receive send and receive um, um, you know data and make calls isn't that a, a phone so the question is why didn't Apple make an iPod touch with a 3G 3G data there were some rumors that Apple was going to come out with that but it didn't and it didn't because it it would compete too much with Apple's partners the cell phone companies and I've heard people on the internet like Leo Laporte say, oh, Apple should make its own network. But Apple's not going to make its own network right now because it makes a lot of money selling through AT&T, selling through Verizon, selling through Sprint. But also remember, it's selling through scores and scores of carriers throughout the world. And Apple is going to continue to make money by expanding in the carriers. And it's not going to do anything to threaten the carriers. And in any case, if you're gonna get a 3G data plan, you have to get it through the carrier. So Apple was able to get it for the iPad, but even like the iPad, look at the concessions. Um, you know, I'm sure they, they, well, AT&T doesn't have to give a 3G data plan to Apple, nor does Verizon or Sprint for just something like the iPod Touch. But if you could get a data plan with an iPod Touch, really you know you have a phone now one of the services that i really want voice over ip with is google voice now the problem with google voice is that it's not really a pure voice over ip service in fact there is no easy way until now maybe to make and receive voice over ip google voice calls on your iphone and what do i mean by that well google voice when it first launched, really, it was Grand, It was a company called Grand Central that was taken over by Apple. The premise was that you get, you know, you get a phone number from Google, and you have a web presence, and that phone can receive calls, and and you can set up your Google Voice account to forward those calls to other phones, and you can get voicemails and the voicemails will be transcribed and forwarded to you both as mp3s and text uh, but google voice wasn't really set up to do voice over ip but recently uh, google did implement the ability to make voice over ip calls um, through the website up till now though up until then what if you wanted to make a call you would use let's say a Google Voice app on your iPhone but it wouldn't make a voice over IP call from your phone rather Google would make the call uh, from using your Google Voice phone but then call your phone using your cell phone minutes and hook up your call with um, the other party that Google 
than called. I mean, it sounds a little convoluted, but the reason it's not ideal that way is because Google ends up using your cell phone mi minutes. And, and it wouldn't work with the iPad because the iPad doesn't have a telephone in it. So what I was hoping for is the ability to like the Skype app to make a true data voice over IP call through the iPhone or iPad using Google Voice. And in a weird sort of way, that's now possible using this OB on device. But hold on, it's not so easy. There's a little twist to this, and let me show you what the twist is. The twist is that the real product that o this company OB High sells is not the app. The app for the iPhone and for the iPad and also the Android app is free. What OB High is selling is something known as an ATA router. And the ATA device is basically this piece of hardware that you connect at home to your internet connection, ideally a high-speed internet connection. And it allows you then to connect that device to regular phones in your home. Not cell phones, but regular landline phones. So it's a way for your regular landline phones to bridge to voice over IP services on the internet. And what's cool about this device and this service from OBHI is that they made it easy to configure with Google Voice so that you can use this device to connect to Google Voice and to make and receive phone calls from Google Voice on your landline phones at home. And why is this important? Because Google Voice right now allows for free calling and receiving phone calls anywhere in the United States and Canada. And there's no monthly fee. So this is pretty huge if you want to save some money. And also Google Voice has very low rates for calling landlines overseas. So if you get this device, you can configure it pretty easily to work with Google um, Google Voice, or you can have it work with other voice over IP services. But, and it comes in two models, and they're only like five or ten dollars apart. One model, the cheaper one, is the OBI 100, and on Amazon you can get it for like about uh, 40 bucks. And the OB110 you can get for like 48 bucks. And the difference is the more expensive one has two phone, you know, those, those phone connections, the traditional phone has two phone connections, and the other one only has one. So what's the difference? Well, the one that has two, you could hook up two phone lines to it. Um, so for example, uh, or you could use one of the phone lines to connect to your regular landline phone and one of the lines to connect to your phone that you're going to be taking the calls with. And what you could end up doing then is have your phone, your landline phone, have two lines. One line that works with your regular, let's say, Verizon phone line, and one line that works with Google Voice over the Internet. So you could keep your regular landline, let's say, if you wanted it for emergencies with 9-11, or use it... Uh, use your phone to make long distance calls and receive them through Google Voice. Um, but here's it gets even weirder and here's where the the, the programs come in um, interestingly. Theoretically these iPhone and iPad programs let's say you had configured your OB100 at home you connect it to the internet, you connect it to the phones and now it's registered. Well you can have your apps on your iPad or iPhone uh, work with your device so that um, they would be recognized. Uh, and what do I mean by that? I mean, if you have the app on your iPhone or iPad, 
you can make a call by having it connect to the OB, OB100 or 110 at home and then take over and make a call through that service. So in a we so here's how it would work. If you had Google Voice on your OB100, you can use your um, OB Talk app on your iPad or iPhone. It's called OB On um, to connect to your device at home and then use the Google Voice to make the call. And similarly, you can have calls to your like home number. Um, ring on your app on the Obion app and so that's pretty wild uh, because now it did work I tried this on my iPad and it did work I was able to make a, a call and I have to configure this so that it can receive the calls and you can go into it so what's interesting in this app is under the category of social networking. Oh, it gets even weirder because if you have this app and other friends of yours who have OB on devices at home, if they um, let you be a trusted friend, I think that's the term. Let's see, what, what is the term they use? Um, well, if they you know if they let you be like a trusted person then you can actually you know let's say somebody's using your obion at home and you're on your ipad and it's busy so you can't use it well you could if a friend gave you access to their obion you could you could call through their connection and their obion could be using let's say vonage or some other um voice over ip but it gets even weirder because let's say let's say y you have a friend who's got the obion device in france and let's say that obion device in france has both phone line connection and also voice over ip well you could over the internet through your ipad obion connect and use the obion uh, OB100 or 110 in in France to make local calls in France while you're in in the United States. So this is pretty wild stuff. And there's other really cool features like the Obions. Actually, you don't even have to sign up for a Voice over IP service. You could each Obion has its own like distinct number, and just through O, the company OBHI's servers, you can call any other OBion device. So if you buy two of these devices and give one, let's say, to your relatives and the relatives plug their phone into it, well, without a computer, you can make voice over IP calls to them just by dialing their unique OBion number. And then the other cool thing is that each of these lines actually can handle two voice over IP lines. So the Obion, the OB1100 model that has two like phone inputs can actually handle four voice over IP lines. So, you know, right now it's free to get like your own voice over IP line. So you could get four of them and have, have your phone connect to an OB1100, but then have four lines. So I don't know why you would want four lines. I guess, you know, if you're getting a lot of calls or running a business, you could put somebody on hold and then switch to another line. And you just switch by, I guess, pressing like a number dedicated to a line and you switch. So it's very, very powerful. Um, other cool features are you can like you can create um, you know up, I think like a hundred um, you know smart quick dialing numbers. In other words, press you can assign to like the number A or one. You could you know I'm going to call this company. So you just press one and pound and it and it does that. So it's very very powerful. Now I will say this. Um, the router works well and the home phone calling works well. The, the, the apps, though, which are rather new on the iPhone and the iPad, 
are kind of buggy. The one on the iPhone 4S, I haven't really gotten able to work. It seems to be stuck on trying to connect to it. And the reviews of the apps are kind of buggy. So I wouldn't get it right now just for the, uh, for the apps on the iPhone or iPad. I would get it as a way to sort of cut your uh, phone bill. I'm dumping my Verizon landline and and actually I figured out a way to transfer my home landline number which is a 212 number to Google Voice. Right now you can't port directly to Google Voice your landline phone number. However, Google Voice will take the porting of cell phone numbers. So if you have a cell phone number that you really like you can transfer it and that'll become your Google Voice number. But there is a hack to bring your landline number to Google Voice and what you do is you you go out and get a cheap go as you pay uh, SIM card and I got one and, and I'm using it with my unlocked iPhone from T-Mobile cost me 10 bucks so I'm transferring my um, Verizon 212 home number to T-Mobile and then once it's a T-Mobile I'm gonna transfer it to Google Voice. So, you know, you, you should check out this site. It's called OBHI, O B I H A I dot com. And they they have a service called OB Talk. And um, this is really cool stuff. I mean, you can really save money. Um, you know, I, I'm not I'm not gonna have any sort of monthly bill unless Google Voice suddenly starts charging for um, calls in the United States uh, and Canada. And the beauty is there's none of those crazy taxes that you see with regular landlines. So it's, it's a very cool product and um, you should um, check it out. It's very cool. Okay, so if, in case you don't know it, if you have a Mac, Apple has released an update to Keynote. It is now Keynote new version 5.1.1 and according to the App Store this update addresses issues when working with large presentations in OS X line it includes improvements in stability and accessibility for Keynote so definitely if you use Keynote you should check it out it um, you know I'll, I'll let people know next episode how well it works Okay, so unless you've been living under a rock, you probably heard of a controversy that's sweeping uh, the smartphone, cell phone market, and that's the controversy over the carrier IQ. What is carrier IQ? Well, basically, a, a young guy who's, I guess, a developer or a hacker or something discovered that on some smartphones, particularly, I guess, Android phones, um, there is a stealth embedded application from a company called Carrier IQ that logs user activities and relays some of that information to wireless carriers without your knowledge. And when it first came out, it said like, you know, uh, this, this software was like logging your browsing and your um, keystrokes and all sorts of data and without your knowledge and sending it. And you know, it's interesting at the beginning, you know, the story was this was mainly on Android devices or I guess BlackBerry and not on the iPhone. Now, it turns out that, like, I guess what's going on is the carriers or the manufacturers who put, you know, had some sort of deal with this company, Carrier IQ, to put in this application before they sold the devices to maybe help with diagnostics or who knows what. Um, and Apple, it turns out then, had some functionality of the carrier RQ stuff, but not in iOS 5, so in prior our operating systems. Now, Mashable, well, this controversy has exploded to the point where Congress is investigating and people are outraged, and, you know, then this could be a violation of the law because you can't secretly take stuff, you know, sensitive data from a phone and send it. So Mashable has a nice overview in an article entitled Carrier IQ in Your Phone, Everything You Need to Know by someone named Peter Patchell. 
and um, here's what it says. It's it's carry IQ is hidden. It's a sort of it's just short of rooting or removing certain software safeguards to obtain administrator access to your phone. It's almost impossible to know if it's there. It's everywhere, according to Mashable. The software reportedly exists on millions of handsets on several carriers, including many Android phones and even some versions of the iPhone. It's not opt-in. You, you, you don't have any explicit approval by the user. And it's voracious, according to Trevor Eckhart, who created the recent explosion of attention on Carrier IQ with a video he posted on YouTube. The software logs every keystroke an incoming text message. Uh, but then it goes on to say there is some question about how much of this information is actually sent to carriers. So, I don't know. I mean, I I mean, I mean, this is problematic. They should disclose what's being sent to carriers. But look, I assumed there was a lot of diagnostic data that the carriers or the handset manufacturers are getting from these smartphones now I mean I don't know to what level but I'm not surprised I mean I do think though that given pr prior past scandals you know where Apple for example was caching data in your iPhone regarding to your geolocation so that the geolocation stuff would work better that caused a lot of controversy last year if you remember and I would think that the carriers then would quickly make sure that everybody knew what kind of diagnostic and monitoring there are on the phones. So look, this is probably going to end in congressional testimony, some investigations. Some people could be charged. The question is, what was their intent? You know, how sneaky, how deceptive, how damaging is this conduct? So this is going to be a brewing story. And the good news, though, is that Apple's not at the center of the controversy. It's uh, the worst of it was it looks like on BlackBerry or or um, or even uh, Android phones. Now, some people criticize Apple for having sort of a closed system, um, but you know one thing that's nice about Apple's closed system is that Apple makes money selling the hardware and selling software, and not really selling advertising. And Google claims to be very open, but Google does sell advertising. Well, there's a story in ZDNet uh, that Google has started to roll out its own ads in the Chrome web browser. And the article asks, is this a deal breaker for you? And sure enough, I went over to the Chrome browser. And if you have a new tab and no page yet, there's an ad that says browse thousands of, um, um, well, no, uh, well, no, I don't see it. But anyways, I guess there's an ad that is in a new Chrome in this new tabs page. So the question is, is, well, I guess this is sort of an ad, browse thousands of apps and games for Chrome. So it's an ad for the app, the Chrome store. So I don't know. I mean, I think, I think it depends on how intrusive the ads are. But I do think at some point people are going to realize that, hey, look, Google makes its money through advertisement. So nothing's really free. Okay, so 9to5Mac has gotten a hold of Apple's internal policies concerning employee behavior on the Internet rumors, leaks, and the company's code of conduct. I learned of this through the Cult of Mac website, which I guess is just reporting on what 9 to 5 has. And there's some interesting stuff in there, but I'm not surprised uh, because it is a very large corporation and it is trying to keep things secret. So what, is, what are some of the interesting facts? It says that employees cannot use blogs, wikis, social networks, and similar online tools to internally communicate about the company. Um, it says that personal websites by employees cannot be used to discuss Apple in any way. Employees are also restricted from commenting on any Apple-related websites. It says that Apple has a zero-tolerance policy on spreading rumors, and employees are not to engage in any rumor discussion with customers. Instead, employees have to say something along the lines of, 
Apple does not comment on rumors about decisions, products, programs, or promotions that have not been officially announced by Apple. And it goes on to say, interaction with customers outside of business purposes is prohibited. Do not use or discuss any information regarding customers for any purpose. It, this includes contacting customers for social reasons or soliciting outside business. And it also says that Apple requests that employees differentiate their work and private email addresses. If you have been given a free Mac me email address to use for non-work related emails, please use that email or another personal email address for those types of communications. Look, I think this is entirely reasonable. I mean, most corporations and government agencies have a, almost the identical policies. You don't you don't leak information. Everything's confidential and basically you keep your work life separate from your social life. It's totally reasonable. I don't think it's particularly outrageous in any way. The Cult of Mac article says, like most companies, a Apple also asks its employees to use disclaimers on websites and social networks. So, of course, like when you're commenting outside of work, you're not speaking on behalf of where you work. You're speaking on your personal behalf. So, um, you know, it's a pretty normal, standard corporate policy. And... Uh, you know, I think it's very reasonable. Well, I'm sure some people will gripe, but, you know, it's a large corporation. How else are you going to keep everybody on the same page? Well, as some of you may know, a while back there was a massive storm and flooding in Thailand where a lot of the world's hard drives are made. And, you know, there were predictions that there was going to be shortages of hard drives. Well, Apple Insider has a story out on today saying that it looks like the, the hard drive shortage may be affecting Apple. And the article says that two terabyte hard drive shortage hits Apple's built to order iMacs with five to six, seven week waits. And I guess they noticed that if you go to the Apple store online, the built to order iMacs with two terabyte hard drives now have an estimated shipping time of five to seven weeks in what is potentially the first sign of Apple being hit by a lingering global hard drive. But I remember all summer long, there were waits for the new IMAX. And um, I don't know. I don't know if there's a shortage or just like we're, you know, we're getting to the holiday season and there's a huge demand for Apple products. Uh, let's go. Let's go to the Apple store. Let's check it out ourselves. We go there. We click on iMac and let's say select a Mac. So if you don't configure it, it's um let's say it says free shipping let's just select the 27 inch one and it says uh free shipping next business day shipping available um now it appears to be ready to ship right away let's see what happens uh it looks like it's right away. So let's now go to, let's now go to um, view cart remove. I don't want to buy the 27 inch one. Um, let's go to the bill to order. What happens if we go to the bill to order? Uh, let's pick the high end iMac and let's get the uh, I don't know. Let's get the, the hard drive. Let's just get, uh, sure enough, if you click, click on the two terabyte, it's five to seven weeks. The one terabyte is right there. Now, what if you got the solid state drive? The solid state drive just takes three to five business days. The two terabyte with the solid state drive takes five to seven weeks. The one terabyte, so it looks like it's the two terabyte drive so who knows maybe it really is you know a shortage of two terabyte drives but look i think i think you should get an ssd drive because that's what really makes these macs fly and what is the future of the mac okay so one of the big stories earlier this week that got around the uh, rumor mills on the internet is that apple is preparing a 15 inch macbook air coming early next year 
And the, uh, I read about this on CBS News, but they're reporting what Digitimes is saying. And uh, Digitimes sources say, according to this article, that the bigger air will complement the current 11.6 and 13.3 inch models already in store. And um, look, I think this totally makes sense. The MacBook Air line is just incredible. I have an 11 inch MacBook Air. I love it. It's so light. It's so fast. And SSD drives are the way to go. And these thinner, lighter, faster SSD drive MacBooks, I think for a lot of people are going to replace the MacBook Pros. And um, I think the 15-inch model is going to come. And I think it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be a lot like the 11-inch and the 13-inch in that it's not going to have a, DV, um, a DVD drive in it. It probably, it might not even have FireWire connections. Uh, it'll certainly have Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt's going to replace a lot of the, a lot of, um, you know, the connections, and it's going to be more mature by that. So now look at the specs now of the 11-inch and the 13-inch. The 11-inch weighs 2.8, 2.38 pounds. The 13-inch weighs just under 3 pounds. So I wouldn't be surprised if the... 15 inch weighs at maybe th three and a half or four pounds. So how would that compare to the MacBook uh, Pro line? So let's go, and weight is really significant. So let's go to the MacBook Pros tech specs. If we go over to the 15 inch. Now the current 15 inch line uh, weighs 5.6 pounds. So think about that. Uh, you could shave a pound. I bet you it's going to be like 13, 3.5, 3.7 pounds, the 15 inch one. And so that's a lot lighter than five and a half pounds. You knock off a pound off of one of these things. It's a lot. And by being thinner and faster with these, you know, a pure SSD drive, it's going to be a very coveted device. Now, there might be some people who really do heavy video editing who want like another big hard drive in the um, MacBook Pro. But really, if, if you have, it's better to have, if you want mobility, you got to get the MacBook Air. I mean, ideally, if you've got a little extra money, I think the ideal setup is to have an iMac uh, with a MacBook Air. Or the other thing that you could do, which is really cool, let's go to um, let's go to the to the monitor. Let's go to accessor accessories. The Apple Thunderbolt display monitor with a MacBook Air. This could meet your technology needs um, there because there's one cable that connects it to the MacBook Air that also has a MagSafe connector to power it. So one cable is the connection for Thunderbolt and the other one, and it splits off and you've got the power connection. And then you can connect a lot of things to the Mac, uh, the Thunderbolt, uh, Air Airport Thunderbolt display. Now it says here, you can connect three powered USB 2.0 ports to the back one FireWire 800 port, one gigabit Ethernet port, and one Thunderbolt port. Port. So remember, the MacBook Air doesn't have a FireWire port, and it doesn't have an Ethernet port. But suddenly, by connecting it by Thunderbolt to your Thunderbolt display, you have Ethernet and FireWire. And so you could just have those devices connected to your display and then just connect your MacBook Air. And that costs about $1,000. That's what they, they charge for it. Hey, I'm curious as to what the, um, the shipping time on the Thunderbolt display is three to five business days. And um, let's see, what, what do the reviews say? Um, one person gives it four stars. Um, one person gives it three stars. One person gives it one star. Huh. So, and some people give it five stars. But anyways, 
I think the 15 inch MacBook Air is the way to go. I think it's going to sell like crazy when it comes out next year. And uh, I think a good complement to it is going to be the Apple Thunderbolt display. Okay, so thanks for listening to episode 100 of the Apple Podcast. It's been 100 episodes, I guess about two years or so. Thanks for listening. This is Lex. Remember, this is a chit chat free podcast brought to you by the MaxFuture.com website. And uh, also check out the iPad podcast, which comes out usually on Sunday nights or Monday morning. Uh, You can also check out the video version of this, which has screen grabs of the different stories I track uh, on YouTube or on Blip TV or on Apple Things in the iTunes store. Thanks for listening. Again, this is Lex, and, um, and see you next week. Take care. This has been a Max Future Production.